What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hackness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is S. Bridgman, and we speak about play and about conflict and how to use both in our facilitation practice and private lives. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to find the link to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Hi, S. Welcome to the show. Hello, Miriam. It is a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to geek out about facilitation and play and the role that play plays when we're in actually non-so-playful or hard situations. Uh, yes, I'm very looking looking forward to diving into this conversation. And it feels like an emergent field. So who knows what's going to emerge from our yes. conversation today? Exactly. And let's start with a little warm up. I always start with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? So I do call myself a facilitator. And I also have all these other terms that are sort of part of a, feel like an umbrella or something. I'll say creative experience designer, process consultant, coach, all these sorts of different things. But I definitely use the word facilitator as, a, as an anchoring point <laughs> within all, all those different, those different labels. And I started calling myself a facilitator. I was working in a self-managed art of hosting inspired facilitation firm <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> I say art of hosting, which is a sort of school of facilitation. Um, I was working there out of university for about four years. And it was quite a transition, meaning that when I arrived there, even though I'd studied communication and human relations, I didn't quite have the ability to hold space for a group, especially when the going got tough. So I began to call myself a facilitator when I was able to lead projects mm -hmm. and the projects would go south, would go bad, and I would still hold it. And then, then I think at that point, I kind of felt like, okay, I, this, this word, this concept works for me. <laughs> I love that. It's like you, you gave yourself permission that you earned the label. <laughs> I earned my stripes, I earned my stripes. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I was. <laughs> Do you recall the situation? I'm very curious to hear about you handling the situation, walking out of that with this maybe sort of pride, like, yay, did it. Finally. <laughs> The situation that comes to mind is that I had uh, was failing. I was, you know, I was leading an activity and I would give the instructions and the group would kind of be like, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would be, I would push through. I'd be like, I see you're not getting it. Let's keep trying at this. And I would keep going and then finish. And then, and then in the feedback, the feedback piece was receiving feedback from my team that all these things had not been good, but I had succeeded it globally had worked so that was the moment where i was like yes i did it <laughs> yeah, yeah and thank you for mentioning that i think we've all been there and sometimes still are there that we maybe it's not a good day or we just explain it in a way that the group doesn't get it and yeah it's just by pushing through and What did your team mean by you succeeded? Was it that finally you could get them do this exercise or that what happened to call it a success? I think it was that there was a, well, I can talk a little bit about my perception of success as well. It was a storytelling lens activity. Sort of, I think in, in Art of Hosting, they call it a collective storytelling harvest. And the idea was that you would listen to a story through different lenses. So it could be a lens of strength or beauty or challenge, and then you'd exchange it with groups. So I think in that case, the success was the fact that the activity was meaningful. People had beautiful exchanges. We were able to make sense of the story, take learnings out of it. I would just bounce onto that and say that my own, my own vision of success, I don't care that much if the instructions are perfect. I don't, I'm totally fine with a rocky trip as long as we reach the intentions of the event or the training or whatever it is. So I'm very, I'm, I'm not so much of the school of thought of let's make it perfect and slick and clean and organized. It's kind of, I'm kind of, uh, you know, take whatever route we need to, to arrive at those original intentions that we've set. Which makes sense. And now... <laughs> I kind of have to, to push this question right afterwards. So what would make a workshop fail? 
Right. This question, the famous question, what makes a workshop fail? So for me, it's really when the person is not able to adapt to the people who are in that room, in that moment, Mm -hmm. doing those exercises. Because I think in the whole thing of facilitation, having a plan or the notion of having a plan is an illusion of sorts, because you can have a completely detailed agenda with the timings and everything. But then maybe this theme or this energy emerges in the group and it's alive. And I think that the the workshop would fail if one stayed to the plan that was there and ignored that energy Mm -hmm. versus like feeling into that just incredible energy that is naturally growing and that no one planned. I think for me, that would be a moment when I would fail if I felt as though I hadn't really been able to listen and really adapt to what was happening. Yeah. And this um, makes total sense to me. And it almost sounds as if this strictness, this following the plan and ignoring what has happened is sort of the antidote to play. Right? You're nice. I, I like the way I like the I like you putting them on that spectrum. Definitely. I'm like, let's organize this. We're doing this A, B, C, D, E versus kind of a thing. You can't see me, but I'm kind of like waving my arm, just like, ooh, like, I wonder where this will go. Maybe we'll experiment. Maybe we'll fail. We'll definitely have a fun time. Definitely. Mm-hmm. That's, I'm much more of the second, the latter. That being said, I do obviously have clients with deadlines and schedules and need to be organized and professional. But I think it's that art of having all those things, but also not having that rigidity and not having that sort of stuckness and that not adapting to that moment. It's interesting that you're mentioning that. And I wonder whether for such clients who are usually very strict with their deadlines and very structured, does it then come to them as a relief that finally they have the opportunity to be a little bit more loose, a little bit more dynamic and spontaneous? Or is this kind of throwing them out of comfort because it's so different from what they used to? What's your experience? I've had lots of clients over the years and some clients that have really enjoyed that. They felt like it's a breath of fresh air because they're able to sort of perhaps see a wider landscape of what's possible. And there is that sort of notion of that alive co-creation that's there. And I've had definitely had other clients that have given me that feedback of wanting, really wanting to like tone it down, rein it in, organize it more. So I think I'm fairly adaptable as a facilitator. I definitely... I definitely have worked in different contexts with nonprofits or with companies or sort of philanthropy and stuff, but I try and stay closer to the clients who can vibe with me just because it's easier for all of us. And we have more fun versus trying to rein it in for a client that wants to think it's a little bit more structured and traditional because there's lots and lots and lots and lots of people that can offer that service. And I'm always happy to refer people. I really believe in the, the relationship with the client. Like when I say a relationship, I mean a life-giving, positive relationship that you want to be seeing each other. So if after a few meetings, you're like, eh, this is feeling flat. It's like, well, regardless of the money or whatever, it's not, maybe it's not a good fit. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah (laughs) hell yeah like hell yeah (laughs) and if the energy is not flowing if we can i think to me at least what i hear it boils down to us being able to be our authentic selves Mm -hmm. and if we have to hold back and we cannot use the energy that we usually bring in or the playfulness or whatever it is that makes us or that defines our facilitation style then we will also fail to allow the participants to join with their authentic selves, which is basically, at least in my understanding, the goal of a workshop that everyone Mm. brings their entire being in and all their talents. I 100% agree with that. If you're showing up fully as your complete, you know, vulnerable, imperfect, trying self, then someone can show up and be like, well, I'm just a person as well. I guess I can be (laughs) here. (laughs) <laughs> and I think on that point of play, like I, sometimes people talk about play as though you need to be like, oh, 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 oh. it's like a quarter of high energy, extroverted play. But for me, it's, that's one version. There's so many ways of playing. Some people have super, you know, really subtle deadpan senses of humor with like little jokes here and there. There's all sorts of puzzle type game things. There's all sorts of experimentations that you can do that are not at all about being loud and playful and putting, you know, dancing around in the room. Although that's also a lovely form of play. So what definition of play would you 
then apply. So what means play for you in your facilitation? How did you actually get to explore play as a tool or as a method? Mm -hmm. Well, I see very much play as like a state of being, one that's very much has a whole number of different characteristics, as I see it, just around curiosity and openness and pleasure and experimentation and right to fail, collaborating, working with people, co-creating. And for me, I think I really stumbled upon play as being sort of a pillar of the work that I was doing when I realized that as a facilitator, I was creating, I needed to be able to create the space that I dreamed of in this world, in that room, in that interaction. So for instance, that image of a snail, of a snail, you have a little snail that's going along the path and has this shell and this idea that, okay, there's a shell and I'm going to invite people into my home. Very intimate. It's my home. It's my inner space. And we're going to have a party, an event. And what is that event going to be like? And for me, that, that answer might look like different things to different people. And for me, the answer was, I want it to be full of a playful vitality. I want us to be able to experiment and laugh and cry, have amazing conversations, be fully ourselves, go to really new depths, new, new areas of thought and exploration. So that's how I see my facilitation is offering that space. And the, the dream and the idea is that in those interactions, those small group spaces, that ripples out. We need a place to practice. We need careful, intentional spaces to practice. And then people can go off into their own lives and experiment in their own ways. But I just need to be really, really clear about what's in my space. How have I curated it? And how have I cultivated that own sense of play and safety and sort of pleasure there? Mm, so much to unpack. The first thing that came to my mind is, as children, we play in order to practice for real life, right? Mm. And that's what animals do. They play so that they are prepared when they grow up to just to certain behaviors. And... Somehow we have unlearned that to use play as a tool to practice. Right. And yeah, exactly. Animals, they practice, they practice a lot of like power games, like, oh, like growling, you know, submissive dominant, trying out whatever the skills are they need in the world. If it's like hunting or if it's children will often play with sort of dolls or Lego kind of interactions. And I, I also want to name that there is this notion in, in the field of play, of like going back to what you love to do as a child. But I definitely... I, I'm totally for that, yes. And I also want to honor that how we play might evolve as we grow up. And some kids didn't have spaces that spaces to play, or maybe they were in environments where the way that they liked to play was not available. Mm -hmm. So all I have to say is that I definitely think that going back to that notion of like original ability to play is beautiful. But if for whatever reason you didn't feel like you were able to access that as a child, regardless of whatever is going on, I really see it as a birthright that is available to us throughout life and that can change and look like different things at different moments. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I somehow had the mindset in mind when I referred to the um, children at play Because children are not afraid of judgment, at least until a certain age. <laughs> And I think that's where then the shell of the snail, it's as if children were naked snails. <laughs> And then suddenly you have this shell. And you have to be very careful whom to invite in and how. And so how do you create this? Or what kind of environment do you need in order to invite someone in and for them to come out of their own? Ah, uh, interesting. That's the question, hey? People are showing up like, okay, how do you create the environment with all the experiences that people are bringing, their days, their lived experiences, everything? Someone recently told me that they didn't want to show up to a workshop because they would just criticize everyone. And, and they said, I'd rather save people for myself. And I, my reaction was very much, well, the whole point of the, facilita the facilitation is to build a container, to build the agreements, to have like the, the slow steps that allow you to be at your most loving self and to be interaction in a positive way with everyone. And so it is my belief. And I've, I've seen this happen with people with, you know, so, so, you know, quote unquote, difficult personalities that if you are able to be really intentional in building that container, again, with the group agreements, with really making sure that every step of the way there is that psychological safety for everyone that's there, that people understand the intention of the space. I think that you can invite people in from whatever 
and really have a meaningful and generative exchange. But that's, I think that's also like a belief that I hold front and center that, and I hope that participants can pick up on that because I do believe that they are fun and caring people. I do. And that sometimes they need some support to let that side of themselves come out. Yeah. And somehow, or I wonder who, when is this put in danger? Because I do also believe that if we are very honest to ourselves and we feel safe enough, we can all admit that this is the place where we want to be. Mm. We don't feel judged where we can show up as our true selves. But then somehow the corporate environment very often turns, especially middle-aged white male, into mm. beings who struggle to admit that. Would you deal with this beforehand or is play then an instrument to to crack the shell slowly this is such a great line of inquiry of how do you go into a corporate environment with these middle-aged white men who are serious and organized and professional and bring in this sort of rhetoric of play or bring in this dynamic of communi authentic communication that maybe does not connect at all with them in that moment I think that's a really good question. And I really like working with adults because I really like working with that specific, <laughs> specific dynamic. <laughs> For me, it's really fun because it's it feels playful to me because it is such a mask. Mm -hmm. So for me, I almost see it as like a, a fun challenge because I know we all, I know that everyone has an inner life. I know that everyone has vulnerability and has a desire to connect. So if someone's giving me, you know, serving me a... Uh, a certain, you know, professional, I have no emotions and I'm just here to perform. I'm like, oh, that's totally fine. You can, you can definitely play that role. You're invited. You're invited to play the game. And hopefully we can, through the interactions, naturally, like I say, that group field will build up to a point where suddenly they feel like they can take a little step outside or to the a lateral step from that role. I want to share a story with you, actually. I had a, because I think it's nice to talk about things concretely as well. Like I had, um, this is a, sorry failure i was in it was a corporate workshop and there's this really there's an activity where sometimes it's like a nuclear bomb sometimes it's a it's a ship where you need to vote people off the ship and it, it's um or vote who's going to be in the bomb shelter so it's it's not a politically correct activity at all it's basically designed to provoke conflict because the idea is you have different profiles of people so you know jenny who's 55 and she's a nurse but she's an alcoholic that kind of thing. And each person has their so-called pro and con. Anyway, so I was doing this in a corporate workshop and I had, it was the first time I was doing it online. And I ended up, and normally it's just in person. And so you just write, write the characteristics down and you have the conversation. We did it online and we added photos. And because we added photos, people chose people of different races, different ethnicities in the photos. And so I had not thought this through or really seen this as a process, as a problematic dynamic. And anyway, so we went through the activity and then at the end, some of the persons were extremely distressed. They were very, with the activity, with also the fact that they were talking about who to save, quote unquote, save, and that race was playing a role in this. And they thought it was just completely offensive, inappropriate, uh, not thought through. And And there was a mix of people having that reaction and a mix of people kind of in that sort of stoic, I'm not going to have any emotions right now. So in that moment, here's the question. How are we playful in this moment as, as this mm -hmm. ship is, the ship is sinking? <laughs> and so, and in that moment, what we did was, or I, what I proposed to the group was, it was a, one of the, the themes that we were working on that, in that training series was open communication in difficult moments. And this was a difficult moment that required open <laughs> communication. So I said, well, let's practice some of this feedback and I'm going to use myself as a guinea pig. So who can give me, um, who would like to offer, we have sort of a, free, a framework of different ways of getting feedback. Who would like to offer me some feedback on this? And I received it. And interestingly, they weren't able to go all the way into how angry they were. So I was like, okay, who else would like to give the feedback? You can really take off, you can take off your, your gloves. You can really give it to me as you're feeling it. And someone was able to do it and really just like give me all of their negative experience and activity. And that moment I was able to receive it and everyone is watching this happening. And for me, that feels like a playful moment because we're navigating, we're playing and we don't know what's going to happen. And they're also seeing, we're practicing for a moment in their team when they're also going to have 
a hard moment and they're in a hard conversation, kind of like those little animals playing. So that kind of thing, I hope that it kind of shifts, even if someone looks like they're not evolving. And there is a shift that's there. We got feedback from the manager that that training series had been helpful for people from being more direct. Hey, since you are listening to this podcast, I was wondering whether you get enough opportunities to exchange, practice and experiment with other facilitators. Have you heard of the Never Done Before Facilitation Festival? It's a 24-hour global event that is co-created by its participants and delivered by some of the most popular workshops work podcast guests. Visit neverdonebefore.org for more information. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK to get a 20% discount. The festival starts as soon as you join. Now, back to the show. Thank you for sharing this anecdote, which makes me think of another conversation I had about games, that the beauty of games is that we can invite a group to adopt a new set of rules for a certain amount of time and therefore yeah don't take the situation so seriously so what you just explained sounds similar by just reframing it into a game and saying okay we are practicing now the tools mm. that we have learned beforehand makes everything possible mm. and wow kudos to you to just stand there stoically and say okay give me all your feedback and using this as a use case mm. i really like what you're talking about rules with rules you can add anything you can make any kind of interaction and it's like there's so much playful possibility there being like we only ask each other questions we're deeply interested in each other that's the game <laughs> you know we're <laughs> we were suspicious of each other. Like this is very much from the world of improv, where it's like you add a rule or a concept or a frame, and suddenly it's like, hmm, hello, nice to see you with mm. that suspicion or that care or that curiosity. So that I mean, there is endless interaction, like endless possibilities for remixing the way we show up every day, the way we interact with each other through those, those adding those rules, those constraints. Yeah. And you just mentioned improv. And I know that you have also experiences in clowning. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious, what is play in the context of clowning and improv and facilitation the same or different? And how do you use these experiences for your work now? Yeah, so I would say in terms of play, I definitely see it as the same across the board because there's like a joyful presence. Mm -hmm. There's a joyful presence that's there in all three of them. And the way I would... The way I use it now in my work, well, I think I think for me, I want all the contracts and all of the things I do to have that sense of fun and co-creation and vulnerability, like I was saying. And you look at improv, improv is all about the yes and, building on each other's ideas, getting that sense of like, oh my gosh, we're going on an adventure. No one knows where it's going. And if I can get that dynamic, the group, amazing. Clowning has this extra dimension of that the authenticity in clowning is, is what makes it funny. A clown is someone who's trying their very hardest and they probably aren't doing it that well, but they're giving it their all. And we're laughing because we see there are humanity, this poor struggling being that cares so much. And I think that reminds us of our, our own struggles. We're trying so hard with these little fists in the air, but it doesn't always work. I trained in, in clowning and improv and just different, I guess, artistic practices when I realized that I needed that interior expansion. I needed that interior expansion and that, and that would not just come from facilitation, mm -hmm. um, just facilitation. I needed to go into other disciplines to have that sort of inner ability to expand and almost like have that spark that if I want to share, I can share it outwards. Can you share your journey? I think that's uh, very interesting. Yeah. Well, my journey is that I... In that regard, I think for many years, I was just, I was shy. I didn't want to be judged by people. I wanted to be shy and didn't want to be judged. Those are two things that were important to me. And I, but I had this sense of like, I, like, I just like, ah, oh, I, I was like, I could feel, I needed to like crack this, this shell or this thing. I had no idea how to do it, but I just decided I was, it was kind of like, I'm going to do everything. Like I need to do, I want to do everything that I can do because this is just not working for me. So I, 
I did I did freestyle dancing, I did improv theater, I did clowning, I did music, I did anything that I could do that would be scary, that would be hard, that would feel like it was helping me creatively expand. And it's one of those things where it was a journey, like it was and it's a journey of a lifetime as well. But at a, at a certain point, I felt as though it did kind of crack open. At one point, I, I took a speaker into the street uh, with music, and I just danced through the, speak, the street to my own music. And the, the, the goal was for me to celebrate and just be and have people, some people hated it, some people didn't care, some people loved it. But for me, it was like, I needed to just have that inner expansion. So that's, that's, that's what kind of led me to weaving in those, those practices into, into facilitation and into your question of, is it, how does play show up for me? It's just um, like you were saying about the facilitator, you being a reflection of where the group can go. For me, it's completely, completely linked. And the group hopefully can go to a place of improv and clowning and enjoying each other. I find this fascinating and intriguing that, so your journey yeah, some, some people hate it, some people love it. And I think for a facilitator, and I believe as much as for a clown, it's important to find comfort in n not being liked, which mm -hmm. is maybe the most difficult one. So it's not our job to be liked, because we sometimes often need to challenge the group and to lean into this discomfort of mm. doing something for which we might not get the approval or the sympathy of a group. And I'd be curious whether you are now after this journey, um, well, <laughs> if the journey ever ends, <laughs> do you feel more or less empathy with participants ah. who are not willing to go there, those who hold back, don't dare? Oh, don't dare. That's such a thank you for that question. I feel more. I feel so much empathy for people that don't dare and are scared. I feel complete care and compassion for them, and I, I think I feel complete joy for someone when they are willing to take a risk. So, I'd like to think that I I have different perhaps a different angle of relationship to different people at different stages along that path, but definitely I the holding of everyone would be, would be there. I, it's not, it's definitely an orientation, but I, I do try and go into a group, not being like, oh, you're my favorite. Oh, you're fun. You're not fun. You know, <laughs> you're like me. You're not like me. I'm really trying to say, like, what are we? Like, what are we together? And like holding, it's that, that energetic holding of the space. And because it is, going back to the idea of the shell, it's like you are creating this utopia. You're creating a utopia in a moment where the space is held, where people are loving and caring and listening, where you can have beautiful experiences and debrief them together. And in that sense, I'm not trying to be like I'm in the street. I'm trying to create another space. I, with, with my family, my extended family, we just, there was these decades of conflict and, and there was this sense of we are not connected. And I started having like a monthly chat with everyone at the beginning. And it was, I held the frame really strongly. And it was, you know, whatever it was, 20, 30 people. And I'm being really careful to make sure we're all listening, people getting a chance to speak. There would be a theme. There was a way I was holding it, really holding it. And after, I think, a year, over a year of those conversations, we were able to move into informal conversations with less facilitation, still some facilitation. So look at that training wheel thing. So anyways, in answer to the thing about empathy, I really, I'm trying to give, I'm trying to give it to everyone. And if it's, like I say, it's an orientation. Of course, there's going to be a participant that I'm like, you are having a bad day and it's annoying me right now because I'm is blocking our work as a group. But I would say the orientation, the underlying thing is me trying to say, oh, where are they coming from? How can we integrate their needs into the group? How can we be together? It's fascinating what you're saying about uh, your family. And I'm curious to hear more because I, I believe that we cannot facilitate and participate at the same time just because mm. we are invested and we cannot really hold the space. Maybe I'm wrong. So I would be curious how it was for you, because also I remember my failed attempts <laughs> of trying to bring my family together to, to talk about difficult issues. And each time I hear, we are not your clients, don't try to facilitate us. Miriam, can you just 
speak normally to us. So not very well received, total failure. And maybe it's because my family is very small. So we're talking nuclear family. Maybe you just need more people. But what is, what is your advice? What's the magic sauce? What did I do wrong? Well, first of all, I want to just like recognize and honor you for trying because that's a big gift that you tried to give. And that's to bring your professional practice and to bring it to your family as an offering. That's beautiful. And if they weren't able to receive that, that's also hard because it's a gift that you offer to the world, right? And so, and so for me, you know, what the magic, what's the magic sauce? So <laughs> that's interesting. One thing that comes to mind. So I have a big family of eight people in my family, my immediate family. I have five siblings and my parents. And uh, well, we came to a breaking point. We came to a breaking point in communication and conflict where I think people were able to feel it as well. So there was the problem that people were realizing we actually need help on this. And I, I think I also was able to show them in through moments and experiences where we could get to. So we did on one point on the beach, for instance, on the beach, we were all there. And at the end of a family trip where everyone was exhausted, like angry, frustrated. And I drew a line in the sand that this is a stage. And it's like, everyone's like, what is going on? And it's like, it's time for a roast. A roast is where you make fun of people. And so we all made fun of each other, imitating each other over the past two weeks. And it, it was hilarious. Like we were, we were just laughing and it was a moment that felt real. So anyway, I think there was the problem. People thought it was a problem. And I think I was able to show them what might be possible. And in terms of your, the point about neutrality, I definitely am explicit about that. And I, in many cases with my family, I, I was explicit about putting my own role, either making it explicit when I was speaking for myself or saying, I'm putting it on a back burner. I'm okay having my own conversations separately with you all, because I think it was, it would be challenging if I would use the facilitation for me to speak first, for instance, or for me to prioritize my own ideas. But I have enough of a relationship with everyone that I was able to say, we'll have our own conversations and I'd like to hold the space for all of you. Love that. Yeah. And I love the roast idea. <laughs> a friend of mine once said, in every joke, there's a piece of joke because all the rest is just truth. And so good. Right? <laughs> so good. You say, oh, in every joke, there's a piece of truth. No, it's the other way around. And using play to actually to give permission to raise the obvious, but to laugh about it. I think that's magic. And it reminds me of a tradition that they have in Burkina Faso in Western Africa, where in order to overcome difficulties amongst different ethnicities, it was a former president who came up with the idea of, um, they call it parenté de plaisanterie, so that there are different ethnicities who are related to each other, and they have permission to make fun of each other. So whenever they would meet in the street, although they don't know each other, but they recognize that they're from this parented ethnicity, they would start to insult each other and, and really make fun to then end up laughing together. Uh, and this was their way of overcoming ethnical problems. That is so powerful. Because if you're able to laugh with someone, laugh at yourself, laugh at them, it builds so much trust and it's funny. We're always talking to, behind each other's backs all the time. <laughs> and here you're actually daring to just say to their face. <laughs> no, that's not, thank you for sharing that tradition. Yeah, it's nice. And still, I think it needs a very safe container and the facilitated space because it can also go wrong. Oh, yes. Yes, exactly. When you're going to these emergent areas, of course, it can, if you, you know, the higher the risk, the stronger the container. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It reminds me of, um, I used to box a lot. Mm -hmm. And when sparring, sparring is huge fun. So it is play. But then there's this moment where there's one punch that is a little bit too strong and it wasn't intentional. But then there's the adrenaline or something, some hormones coming up, and then you get stronger as well. And suddenly you went from a sparring to a real fight without even realizing it. Right. And I can imagine that with these games where you use 
a real reflection in a fun way. It can be very subtle, but then become a spiral. So how would you avoid that? Or what do you think if someone in the audience thinks, oh, yeah, I'm going to try that, a roasting, mm -hmm. what would be your advice or your guidance to avoid a spiraling that can be hurtful and harmful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that spiraling is really well said. I think the metaphor boxing is also so strong because, yeah, you're like, ha, ha, ha. And then I was like, you're like, oh, how dare you? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I, I do like to think of the, uh, I have the word in French, échafaudage, it's a scaffolding, mm -hmm. the scaffolding. And that burning thing, I would never do it unless it was like a team that really knew each other. So if a team that had been working together for a year and really had that such high levels of trust. I do like an activity on active listening, for instance, active listening and in arguments, like when it's this idea that if you're in an argument or you're in a conflict, you need to both hear each other first before going into a solution space. But the thing is you can't do that active listening activity on a big conflict because it brings up so much and suddenly you're in the deep water and suddenly you're flailing and suddenly the exercise, you know, you're triggered or whatever's happening. So the, the way I do it is finding that really small little step. So find a very small, small, small thing that you disagree on. For instance, a TV show that one of you likes does not like, a food that one of you likes does not like, something that is just completely, you know, you can talk about it, but it's just not going to bring up that much in theory. And then you practice the act of listening on this, on that specific thing. So let's say you loved the TV show Friends. One person says all the things they love about it. And the person's role is simply to active listen. It's just simply to be there and to not, not question, not judge, not defend. And then they go and they share why they don't like it. You know, saying whatever, it's just like an endless loop of relationships that make no sense. And the person, okay, I hear for you. It's just, it doesn't make sense. It just keeps going on and on, all these relationships. And so that's like a very small step. And I think if you, I love going to the deeper waters with a group, but it does need to have that scaffolding of really building like a success in that first level. Then maybe trying it on a second level is a little bit more real. And then if you're, you know, going, 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 going. <laughs> yeah. And then... Would they paraphrase or what happens after the listening? So I, I listen to an opinion that is not mine. Mm -hmm. And what am I doing with this opinion? Am I just acknowledging, thanking, paraphrasing? Yeah, so I definitely, I, I provide sort of different strategies on active listening that can include just being silent, that can include uh, nonverbal just acknowledgement that could include paraphrasing that could include repeating that could include reflecting the content or the emotion that you're hearing. The main point I think is beyond the actual active listening techniques is to stay focused on the other person and to not be focused on your own reactions to what mm -hmm. they're saying, which sounds so simple, but actually, honestly, if the whole world <laughs> would learn how to do this, I feel like all romantic relationships would just be 10 billion times better because you know, it's the trap of one person saying something And then the person, as opposed to really being present and really tuning in, being like, what do you mean? Or it's not a question of like, I hear you saying this, or this is what I'm understanding. Is that what I understand? Is that what you're saying? Going into, yeah, well, you did this to me as well. Or yeah, but <laughs> it's just that whole, it's the, it's like, it's like the very basis of dysfunctional conversations, which is why I like that activity because it allow it's the very first step of a beautiful generative conversation is just to hear each other. Yeah. 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 Not to get taken away with our emotional response. Yeah, oh, definitely. I, I have, um, so I'm polyamorous and I, so I have different relationships that I communicate a lot with or different connections, I might say. And the other day I was seeing, connecting with someone new and if, I think he was, I, at one point I was like, oh my gosh, let's have some conflicts so we can practice listening. And he was like, what are you talking about? Like, he's like, what is going on in your mind. I'm like, no, of course, if we can manage, if we can communicate beautifully through the conflict, it's a beautiful sign and we can practice and get better together. <laughs> he's like, like uh-huh. Okay. But I hear that. <laughs> you must say, I never date a facilitator again. Never date a facilitator again. I think we make great people to date. It just, it requires a little bit of knowing when to put your hat on and hat off. Like when are you, when are you holding and when are you just a person that's just in the interaction? And if you can manage that, that dynamic, it works well. What does not work well is the total control of everything. Like I will control this relationship and our interactions and all of the communication. And that person's like, well, calm down. 
And I'm asking all these meaningful questions and I'm holding the space and I'm such a good listener. And what I realized that very often when we are taking our facilitator's head off, we're actually the worst of all of that. That, so that was a good burn. Like that was a burn for facilitators. That, very, good job. Very nice. <laughs> exactly. It's actually very pompous. It's a very pompous posture of thinking that one has such good communication. One is so much better. And in a friendship or in a relationship, it's kind of like, who do you think you are? Like we're all trying here. And just because you work in this does not mean that your knowledge or your experience or your methods are more valid than mine. So I've learned this the hard way and hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully, I'm a little bit more humble in this regard. Thank you to all of my exes for your help in that regard. Hello, listener. Are you tired of listening to my podcast voice praising our sponsor Session Lab in each episode? I think it's time to pass the mic over to you. So if you are as much of a Session Lab fan and user as I am, please share your experience and praise and don't be shy of adding a sentence of self-promo. Send me your soundbite and you might hear yourself on the next show and find your name and URL in the show notes. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.